Okay, well, we're um, past ten now, so if you're ready. Yep. Hello. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats. I'd like to welcome you all to the first international conference on the GNU General Public License version 3. Uh, just one small matter first before we begin. Uh, some of you are, have been asked to attend uh, discussion committees uh, at lunchtime today, but you may not have received an invite. Uh, if you could, after this session, go to the Free Software Foundation booth outside the hallway here, and uh, we'll help direct you. I'd like to introduce you to FSF Free Software Foundation founder and president, Richard Storman. <clears throat> Hello and welcome, and I'm glad that you're interested in making the GNU GPL version 3 as good as it can possibly be. <clears throat> We've been using this license for a long time, and we've discovered various points where it was either confusing or needed to be adapted. And meanwhile, the world has sprung very nasty threats on our community and on all software users. So we need to update the GPL. We've known this actually for many years. <clears throat> we had some sessions about four years ago working on updating the GPL. But then things went on. And we decided this year we're going to sit down, we're going to take a lot of time, and we're going to get it finished. <clears throat> the biggest change we've made is in the area of license compatibility, helping to, well, partly removing an inconvenience, an obstacle that has prevented combining code from various free software packages. There are some other free software licenses that are compatible with GPL version 2, and people can mix the code. For instance, that's under the X11 license. People can copy that into GPL-covered programs and do. We've put in provisions to extend the range of compatible licenses. There are additional licenses now that will be compatible with the GPL and it will be possible to copy the code or link it together in a, com in a combined larger program. <clears throat> this, we think, will help our community. Aside from that, the biggest changes, I believe, concern DRM. Digital restrictions management threatens the freedom of every computer user. It's fundamentally based on denying users the freedom to control the software that they operate. DRM is an example of a malicious feature, a feature designed to hurt the user of the software. And therefore, <clears throat> it's something for which there can never be toleration. And DRM is fundamentally based on activities that cannot be done with free software. That's its goal, to make sure that there are things that users can't do with free software. That's the, that's the direct opposite of our goal, which is to do everything with free software. Unfortunately, some of that software is, circulates only underground in the U.S. because it's been forbidden with the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that imposed censorship of software in this country. And now Europe has a similar system, although it, do it doesn't have to be as harsh, but most countries have made it even harsher. So <clears throat> this is free software whose development will have to go on underground. <clears throat> but what we can do with the GNU GPL is to prevent our software from being perverted or corrupted so that it doesn't really respect the user's freedom anymore. For instance, the TiVo is designed so that if you modify the program and install it, it won't run. We have written provisions designed to forbid that use of our software. We can't forbid people from making such devices, nasty as it is, but we can we believe, forbid them to use 
GPL-covered software in that corrupt way. <clears throat> Other substantial changes relate to software patents. We've decided to put in an explicit patent license grant following the lead of many other free software licenses that have come out over the past decade. <clears throat> We've also put in a very, very narrow kind of patent retaliation. And that is that if somebody is running a mod modifies, well, if, if person A makes a modified version of a of a free soft, of a GPL covered program and has a patent and says if anyone else makes a, such a modified version and runs it I'll sue him or if, if he does sue someone then he loses the right to make any further modifications and run them which means he can't maintain his program anymore so commercially speaking it's not viable for him to do that so this is a way of, of dealing with one particular danger that can occur when people make modified versions and run them. They don't have to release their, their modified version, but they mustn't try to stop other people from writing similar modifications on their own. <clears throat> There are a bunch of other smaller changes, and Eben is going to be going through the whole license, explaining them step by step. So I don't think I need to say any more right now. Um, have you noticed anything I should cover which I no. haven't? <clears throat> there are a lot of changes in various places that are designed to say things in a way that is more independent of possible variation between different countries' copyright laws. These, in substance, these are almost insignificant, but they help the license do its job, the same job, more effectively. <clears throat> oh, and there is one error in the draft that's been posted uh, in the joke in the instructions at the end, a change was made that hadn't actually been cleared with me, and I'm not actually planning any change there. But that won't affect any of the substance of the license itself. So I will now turn things over to Eben Moglen. Thanks, Richard. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, glad to see you all. It's uh, been a little lonely uh, and a little too secret uh, for the last several months. Uh, I uh, like better the public practice of law, and uh, it's a pleasure now to be in a position to talk about the work we have been doing. I started working uh, with Richard uh, 13 years ago. Uh, and I hadn't been working with him, I think, for more than a couple of months before we started talking about what would follow GPL2. Uh, the last few months, uh, we've worked together more closely on this license than in all the previous years put together, and it's been a wonderful experience. <coughs> now I want to share that work with you at the beginning of an even better time, which is the larger and deeper collaboration. I'm going to spend the next uh, hour and a half or so walking through the license. Uh, you will note that we haven't given you pieces of paper to turn, uh, but at the close of these remarks, everybody here and everybody else uh, in the world who cares through gplv3.fsf.org will be holding a copy of the first discussion draft. Uh, as Richard has indicated, uh, there are a few changes directed primarily at the preservation of principles and many changes directed at the improvement of usability, clarity, compatibility, and the international reach of a movement which has gone in the past 15 years worldwide. 
Uh, I think that there's little that I could say that would attract anybody's interest at this stage, and so I'll stop speaking my words and start speaking the words of the license. You see before you the definitions in section zero of the license. Uh, and I have uh, highlighted one phrase about which I want to speak uh, a little bit more in depth. To propagate a work means doing anything with it that requires permission under applicable copyright law other than executing it on a computer or making private modifications. This strategy of using a new term of art to propagate software, not reflected in any particular copyright statute, reflects an overall drafting decision to attempt to cut the language of the license loose from any particular system's copyright law. We now speak in terms that can be defined factually in relation to the program or in relation to the full set of exploitation rights or use rights, distribution rights that a particular territorial scheme of copyright may impose. To propagate, then, is to take any action concerning the program which is not one of those, namely the right of execution and the right of private tinkering and modification, which we regard as fundamental and uncontrollable by law. The source code for a work means the preferred form of the work for making modifications to it. Object code is any non-source form of a work. Again, our goal is to make simpler factual determination possible with respect to categories that may vary as systems of law are either more or less advanced in their assimilation of computer science knowledge. I have highlighted here in our definition of complete corresponding source code another phrase added to the license for the purpose of clarification you will note that the complete corresponding source code for a work in object code form includes any shared libraries and dynamically linked subprograms that the work is designed to require. We believe that this will lay to rest controversies which have occasionally arisen in past years concerning the nature of our intentions and the role of dynamic linking as opposed to static linking in the combining of code. From our point of view, this was always a question of fact. What had the licensor intended? And we believe that the matter is now clear. As Richard has said, one of the fundamental goals in the making of this license is to indicate the nature of our relationship to the attempt to restrict users' rights in copyrighted works. For which purpose complete corresponding source code also includes any encryption or authorization codes necessary to install or execute the source code of the work as modified by you in the recommended or principal context of use, such that its functioning in all circumstances is identical to that of the work, except as altered by your modifications. I would translate that for vernacular use into plays all the same movies. Our goal is to make clear that GPL software may not be used to create forms in which tinkered versions will not run or will not run for the same purposes and on the same data. It is fine, as Richard says, with us for people to use our software for purposes that do not attempt to turn the mechanisms of freedom against itself. But when the mechanisms of freedom are used to create unfreedom, it goes further than the GPL can possibly be expected to follow. And we will not go there. On the 
screen at the moment is our modified version of what came to be known in the past 15 years as the system library exception dealing with the question when source code need not be provided for components of combined works, including GPL software, because the components were already available as part of the operating system or operating environment, and the user could be expected to have either the source code or as much access to the source code as the operating system or environment permitted. That version of the exception in GPL2 was both over and under inclusive in ways that created difficulties. Certain behavior, such as combining the GCC compiler or other GPL applications with the C libraries of proprietary operating systems or operating systems under GPL incompatible licenses had been challenged as violations of GPL where we thought that they were reasonable and permissible uses of GPL works. Other modalities which we considered evasions of GPL had been claimed to qualify under the system library exception. We have rewritten it in order to bring the rather tricky business of that exception to within what we believe is imperceptible tolerance of all important cases in both directions. Here and elsewhere, we have had to accept some additional complexity in order to achieve precision in the protection of freedom. We look forward to discussing all such cases in the license with you over the next year. We have never elected for complexity for its own sake, but we want to state at the outset that sometimes in order to do the work we have to do, simplicity must give way to the protection of freedom. And in this instance, that is clear. Chris, I, I should just say at the beginning that I've got a lot of ground to cover in this initial presentation. We will be taking questions at the end and over the next two days. I hope we'll be responsive to everyone, but I want to roll through this as best I can right now. Um, basic permissions. Mr. Turner will be resigning from the Free Software Foundation in the morning. Well, maybe we should say, if you, if you have brought in a portable tracking and surveillance device, please switch it off. And of course, if you really wanted to stop reporting your movements, you should take the batteries out. The uh, police have already tracked you here. And, uh, of course, if they're interested in what we're saying, they are welcome to attend, and I believe some of them are here. <clears throat> uh, Richard, can I borrow some aluminum foil? We have, as you will see at the close of the first paragraph, uh, taken a step which we believed was always a uh, clear and is now uh, explicit that uh, this license is meant to acknowledge and encourage the development of fair use doctrine. Uh, we're glad there is still some vestigial fair use doctrine in the United States, uh, and we hope there will be an increase rather than a decrease in fair use doctrine around the world in years to come. Uh, we thought this license made that clear, but we wish to make assurance doubly sure. The highlighted passage reflects, uh, as Richard told you, the one narrowly targeted form of direct patent retaliation we have elected to include in this license. We are not grand theorists of patent retaliation. We have been saying for 20 years that patent, for nearly 20 years, that patents would be a terrible problem threatening the very existence of software freedom. I hope that it is clear to all now that we were right. Uh, nonetheless, we believe that broad patent retaliation clauses in licenses promise more to users than they can really deliver. 
because the deterrent effect of denying people the right to have and use and distribute free software is not enough in and of itself to break most patent aggression schemes. Where we have satisfied ourselves that narrow, targeted retaliation may have true deterrent effect, we have, however, incorporated it into the license as part of a general attempt to do everything we can about the patent problem. Here we believe that one narrow form of retaliation may actually have meaningful effect. So this license gives unlimited permission to privately modify and run the program provided that you do not bring suit for patent infringement against anyone for making, using, or distributing their own works based on the program. And as Richard has already told you, we believe the operative effect on this, of this clause would be to deny continued opportunity to maintain privately modified versions on the part of any party who seeks to use its own patent claims to prevent similar or equivalent modifications from being made by others. In this very narrow field, we think retaliation may actually deter aggression, and we wish, therefore, to include it. Please note also the way in which the next paragraph makes use of our copyright culture free notation scheme. Propagation of covered works is permitted without limitation provided it does not enable parties other than you to make or receive copies. Propagation which does enable them to do so is permitted as distribution under sections 4 to 6 covering distribution of the license. So let us just for a moment attend to the question of non-US statutory copyright schemes under the new license. If the copyright scheme relevant to a particular work, place, and time speaks, for example, in terms of making available, public communication, uh, public display, and performance of software, then those activities are propagation because they require permission. The question now again is a factual question. Does each of those particular modes of propagation enable others to make or receive copies? If so, then the license covers that activity by a permission contained in the distribution provisions. We are not dependent upon the incorporation of a local statutory definition of distribution, by which change we hope to bring to clarity another subject which was often hotly debated under GPL2 and for which no definitive answer could be given. We cannot, any more than any other license drafter can, achieve simultaneously coincident compliance with every statute in the world. It can't be done. The statutes give different lists, and those lists are differently exclusive. By delinking our terminology from anybody's particular statutory terminology, we believe that it will be possible to localize the license to particular circumstances and territorial copyright schemes without changing the license text itself. As a free software license, as Richard has told you, this license intrinsically disfavors technical attempts to restrict users' freedom to copy, modify, and share copyrighted works. Each of its provisions shall be interpreted in light of this specific declaration of the licensor's intent. We wish courts all over the world to understand that our intent is to maximize freedom, not to restrict it and that every provision should be so understood when effect is given to its terms. Regardless of any other provision of this license, no permission is given to distribute covered works that illegally invade users' privacy, nor for modes of distribution that deny users that run covered works the full exercise of the legal rights guaranteed, granted by this license. Our goal here is to make clear that acts with our software that violate local law 
are not permitted by the license, thus allowing private enforcement for copyright infringement to assist local regulatory enforcement of laws against spyware or user disablement. We are not here ruling any particular conduct to be in violation of the license. We are only saying that what is forbidden by local regulatory or criminal law is also not permitted by an act of the licensor's intent. Our hope is that in some cases this will assist copyright holders and licensors to see that local laws against various malware behavior are fully enforced through use of private law as well as public law sanctions. No covered work constitutes part of an effective technological protection measure. That is to say, distribution of a covered work as part of a system to generate or access certain data constitutes general permission at least for development, distribution and use under this license of other software capable of accessing the same data. In the United States, this language we believe has specific consequences with respect to the Digital Millennium Copyrights Act. We wish to point out that no GPL program can be regarded as a measure in circumvention of any other GPL program's access protection schemes. We believe that this language will also provide some assistance in achieving similar results under statutory enforcement schemes in pursuance of the EUCD and other international regulation meant to assist disablement of users. Here again, we are simply speaking to courts to explain how we understand the intent of licensors. We have no power to change local law, but we do have power by giving permission to make clear where our permissions should not be misread under local laws that presume user disablement from mere technological existence. The distribution sections 4 to 6, and I am here presenting 4, the verbatim copying section, have been modified only slightly. In this particular instance, only to take account of the new license compatibility provisions in section 7, which I will be working through in detail with you in a moment. Note that we are not making any change in this license which affects any existing distribution system by placing it outside the pale of GPL. Nothing we announce today in this first discussion draft breaks any legitimate freedom respecting business model currently in existence. No one must come today to the conclusion that she or he must fight to remain in the community if what you have been doing was compliant with GPL version 2 and was not based upon disabling users' freedom in some DRM-ish way, no change that we here announce puts you out of the pale. We have made changes to include more parties in the community. We have made changes that exclude no legitimate member of our community. The fundamental copy left provision of the GPL, which was in section 2B and is now in section 5B, is here before you. It has been modified in a few slight ways designed to increase clarity. A reference to the absence of any license charge in GPL V2 was sometimes misunderstood sometimes deliberately misunderstood, to suggest some conflict with the commercial distribution of the software. We have removed that phrase so as to avoid a trap for the unwary mind. And we have clarified that the obligation to provide source code to those who have binary versions is based normatively on their possession of a copy of the binary. 
anyone who has a copy of the binary is entitled to a copy of the source, no matter how they came by it. We have slightly generalized the question of notices and when you must preserve notices concerning copyright status, attribution, and absence of warranty. In addition, because in GPL'd works under our enhanced compatibility provision, portions of the work may bear additional terms, either permissions or requirements, we add a requirement that any additional terms on any portion of the work be clearly stated in one central place in the work so that mechanical as well as human means of reviewing source code can immediately and unambiguously locate all additional terms that may be borne by any piece of a GPL work and to make clear which pieces those are. We believe that such a scheme is administrable in the 21st century as it would not have been in 1991 because sophisticated, automated source code handling, reviewing, and valuation systems are already in wide use and many members of this community, both commercial and non-commercial, are working to improve such facilities all the time. We have made a few slight changes concerning the treatment of portions of a GPL work which could stand on their own as separate works and which are subject to GPL terms and only to GPL terms when despite their possible separate existence they are distributed as part of a larger GPL whole. These changes are solely for clarity and to take account of our expanded compatibility provision. We see no operative change in the nature of our language on this point and we believe that except with regard to expanded compatibility, no change in fact occurs. I would call your attention here to a definition of aggregation so as to avoid certain discussions and confusions which we saw occurring over the last decade. A compilation of a covered work with other separate and independent works which are not by their nature extensions of the covered work in or on a volume of a storage or distribution medium is called an aggregate if the copyright resulting from the compilation is not used to limit the legal rights of the compilation's users beyond what the individual works permit. And then the phrase which became familiar in GPL2, mere inclusion of a covered work in an aggregate does not cause this license to apply. This, we believe, will allow courts and parties seeking commercial certainty to know for sure what aggregates are and to avoid certain edge cases which have arisen in the past and caused confusion or doubt. We wish to make clear with respect to the problem of binary distribution accompanied by source and which is now non-source distribution, given our definitions of object code and source code, that we expect source code to be available on durable physical media as an option. We have no intention to preclude continuing and expanded reliance on electronic distribution of source code, but we wish to make clear that we believe the obligation is to provide at the user's option, durable, physical versions of source code verified by the distributor to make the non-source version distributed. Given the increasing embedding of GPL code in end-user consumer products, we have made one other slight change highlighted here. The written offer for source code valid for at least three years was a sensible approach to the term of the offer for source 
when software distribution was only software distribution. We now believe that it is reasonable to say that if you distribute a consumer product containing GPL software, that you should be prepared to offer source code for that product for as long as you also offer either spare parts or other customer support. That it is not acceptable to, to delay the date of other spare part or service beyond the date at which you are also in a position to help people exercise their rights as to the software embedded in devices. We have taken one additional measure of clarification designed to ease a restriction in GPL version 2. If you distribute the non-source or object code of a product by offering access to copy that non-source version from a dedicated place, you may offer equivalent access to copy the corresponding source in the same way through the same place. I am sorry to make meaning depend upon a preposition, but the goal here is to prevent those cases in which it appeared that the very same server needed to be the server distributing the source code that was also distributing the non-source version of the work. A single portal through which a user can gain access to both a server for the source and a server for the non-source is sufficient, which will include pointing upstream at an upstream source supplier, provided that the source available upstream is the complete and corresponding source and that it is guaranteed to be available for the relevant period of time but we did not want to give the impression that in an age of web distribution and complex multi-layered multi-meta distribution structures that all source always had to be located on the same physical server as the non-source version being distributed. We have taken a step that we had hoped would be unnecessary, but time has proved that it is necessary to say that obfuscation of the source provided is not permitted. It may not be distributed encrypted, it may not be distributed packed without the packing tool, and etc. We regret that it was necessary to take that step. We should not have needed to spend those words but there have been a few bad actors out there and they should receive no safe harbor in the license. Now, I want to turn our attention to the question of enhanced compatibility. <clears throat> GPL version 2 was as strict a copyleft as a copyleft can be. It said you must distribute derivative works and modified versions under this license. Nonetheless, some additional terms could be added even to the strict copy left of GPL2. We called them exceptions. They were additional permissions. GPL version 3 in our first discussion draft formalizes that exceptions process as well as the granting of certain, uh, uh, imposition of certain kinds of additional requirements on code with the attempt to permit mixing GPL code with code bearing additional permissions and requirements that may come from other licenses. The case of permissions is the simpler case, and our drafting starts there. When you release a work based on the program, you may include your own terms covering added parts for which you have or can give appropriate permission as long as those terms clearly permit all the activities this license permits or permit usage or relicensing under this license. That, in effect, re recapitulates the situation under GPL2, but does so explicitly. Your terms may be written separately or may be this license plus additional written permission. I wish to point out that we now make clear that we believe that permissions additional to GPL should be in writing. I am not talking to any particular development project under GPL when I say that we believe that unwritten permissions have caused a certain amount of grief. 
because people didn't know what the terms really were. And we think that's a practice which it is no longer desirable to renew. If you so license your own added parts, those parts may be used separately under your terms, but the entire work remains under this license. Those who copy the work, or works based on it, must preserve your terms, just as they must preserve this license. Aside from additional permissions, your terms may add limited kinds of additional requirements on your added parts. That is to say, GPL v3, if represented by our discussion draft, would permit subparts added to GPL works to bear requirements beyond the requirements of the GPL in certain narrow areas. The three you see before you on the slide concerning preservation of copyright and legal notices, attributions, misrepresentations, prohibitions of misrepresentation of origins, requirements of markings, those will achieve compatibility with permissive licenses that contain various kinds of advertising restrictions or notice clauses. The goal here is to secure total compatibility with licenses with which we had previously insignificant but nonetheless preventive incompatibilities. B, they may state a disclaimer of warranty and liability in terms different from those used in this license. Our goal is precisely to permit code to acquire disclaimers which are based upon territorial laws of warranty or representation of fitness other than those characteristic of the United States. We therefore believe that it will be possible for code to bear appropriate national or territorial disclaimers without raising needs for nationalized licenses or some additional scheme to permit amendments. All such licenses will be compatible and the additional requirements of warranty disclaimer will simply additively apply to code as it moves around the world. And C, like additional requirements may prohibit or limit the use for publicity purposes of specified names of contributors and may disclaim trademark usages as part of the licensing of the software. These three terms put together will put to rest, we believe, incompatibilities with all the generally permissive free software licenses with which GPL2 was incompatible for reasons it was not our intention to see long term as barriers to the sharing and collaboration of code and projects. Two more classes of requirements additional are also permitted and these are more complex and require more discussion. The, the, work, the requirements added to additional parts of the work may require that the work contain functioning facilities that allow users to immediately obtain copies of its complete corresponding source code. This is a generalization of an experiment that we tried in the Afero GPL. It is the only step that we take in this license towards dealing with the question of modified versions of software performing remote services. Our position is that if you develop code under GPL that performs remote services, you may include in your code a facility that allows the client side receiving such services to request immediate transmission of the server side code. You can require in your terms that that facility not be removed. We have not added such a term to GPL. We do not plan to add such a term to GPL. We merely say that GPL will be compatible with the imposition of those terms by so many developers as wish to do so. And therefore, those who wish to develop such code and protect against others offering similar remote services on the basis of modified versions may do so. 
GPL does not enforce such a restriction, nor does it prohibit mixture of code bearing such a restriction, and we believe that balance is appropriate given the division of opinion in the community and the diversity of models of use of our code, commercial and non-commercial, at this time. Part E, which is phrased with some complexity, unfortunately, but it is necessary, states Again, a position on a subject of great controversy in which we wish to secure flexibility. Part E contains a definition, a two-part definition, of what we consider defensive patent retaliation. And we say that you may put defensive patent retaliation additional requirements on your parts of a GPL'd work if you wish to, and those parts will bear that requirement but can be admixed with other GPL code. Again, we do not enforce those requirements, but we do not prohibit code bearing such requirements to be mixed with GPL code. The definition we have offered is a meta-language definition of defensive patent retaliation terms. We have worked it very carefully. We have subjected it to formal verification process. And we believe that it correctly describes all of the cases that it was our intention to include and none of the cases it was our intention to exclude. I will say here about those conclusions that the patent retaliation provisions of the ASL2 and the patent retaliation provisions of the Eclipse license in our working of this example meet this standard. Accordingly, we believe that without further alteration were this discussion draft to be GPL3, it would have attained full compatibility with both ASL2 and the Eclipse license, which are presently separated from compatibility with GPL version 2 by their patent retaliation terms and those alone. No other conditions are permitted in your terms beyond additional permissions and the requirements delineated in this exclusive list A through E. Therefore, no other conditions can be present on any work that uses this license. This license does not attempt to enforce those additional terms or assert they are valid or enforceable. It simply does not prohibit one from employing them in admixture with GPL code. <clears throat> this <clears throat> system of enhanced compatibility requires some additional administrative provisions in Section 7. When others modify the work, if they modify your parts of it, they may release such parts of their version under this license without additional permissions by including notice to that effect or by deleting the notice that gives specific permissions in addition to this license. This implements a term which was found in many of the formalized GPL exceptions that were built up over the last 15 years, including those authored or edited by the Free Software Foundation itself. Additional permissions placed on code from which you derive are explicitly optional. And as you modify those parts, if you wish to remove the permissions, you can. It is clear, however, that additional requirements, such as those about remote services or those about patent retaliation, cannot be removed when you modify the code from which you derive whatever you make, because nobody has the power to remove those requirements but the party who placed them on its code in the first place. Unless the work also permits distribution under a previous version of this license, all the other terms included in the work under this section must be listed together in a central list in the work. As I said, we believe that this provision requiring a single central list of all additional terms will facilitate an automated compliance activity to ascertain easily and quickly 
all the terms that apply to particular code within a larger GPL'd work. The first part of that sentence is an example of a general drafting requirement. We have many programs in the world that are presently circulating under GPL2 or any later version and will therefore be subject to the activity of the automatic reversioning clause in GPL2. We have been sure in our drafting that no such program ceases to be in compliance with GPL3 if it was in compliance with GPL2, a property of the current discussion draft which we must preserve as we work on this license in the coming year. It is not acceptable for us to wind up with a final draft in which GPL2 compliant programs in current use and circulation are not able to make the version transition to GPL3 by virtue of something that's already true of them which would suddenly make their distribution as currently undertaken license violating. What? It's on? Is it on? Yes, it is now. Uh, I'd like to add a few things to that. <clears throat> that's true about the uh, parts of a license that concern how things should be labeled and so on, that is, bureaucratic re requirements. We're trying to make sure that no bureaucratic requirements that we add cause trouble for the existing or th theoretically future GPL version 2 or later programs. In some cases, we've made substantive changes in requirements, such as in uh, <clears throat> the exception for certain libraries from the complete corresponding source code. And that substantive change might, in fact, cause certain way, well, not the actual source code of GPL programs, but certain ways of distributing them in, as executables might be left out. It's the bureaucratic kinds of requirements which we're trying to make sure do not cause any trouble for them. Now, we've done our best, but we may have overlooked something, and that's one of the specific kinds of things we're hoping you'll check. If you see anything in there where some kind of requirement for how, you, how to do things right might cause trouble for programs that are already out there that are fine under GPL version 2 and say GPL version 2 or later, please tell us about them. Those we really need to fix if there are any mistakes there. You see before you a slightly modified version of the termination clause. The verbal change is slight, but its effect is somewhat more substantial. Uh, you may not propagate, modify, or sublicense the program except as expressly provided under this license. Any attempt otherwise to propagate, modify, or sublicense is void, and any copyright holder may terminate your rights under this license at any time after having notified you of the violation by any reasonable means within 60 days of any occurrence and then as in GPL2, parties who have received copies or rights from you under this license will not have their licenses terminated so long as they remain in full compliance. The automatic termination provision of GPL version 2 was crucial to the enforcement of the license in the state of affairs that prevailed for us in the 1990s. We had a very slim compliance staff available and we were at the Free Software Foundation the only party in the world full time recurrently engaged in enforcing the license. Automatic termination meant that nothing depended upon our notification and it allowed us to work to get parties back into compliance by beginning from the proposition that they had already lost their right to distribute by the act of violation. We live in a different world at present where far more people are far more surveillant of the possibility of infringement of the license and where the worldwide commercial and non-commercial use of the software has burgeoned to the point 
at which automatic termination, though still beneficial to compliance, raises too many other costs and difficulties, particularly for parties engaged in what we think of as whole distribution inadvertent violation situations, where an unintentional violation of the license left the party vulnerable to compliance activity, including injunction or damages claims, from a very large number of potential claimants. The Free Software Foundation historically acted as an aggregator of claims under those circumstances. We tried to contact all parties who might conceivably have claims so as to be able to assure a party in non-compliance that if they got into compliance and worked matters out with us, they could achieve peace in a practical way from everybody. It is now a better system for all parties, we believe, to move to a regime in which if you, are, if you cure a violation promptly and hear no complaint for 60 days after cure, you know that you have brought any theoretical liability to a conclusion. The stress, therefore, is upon the deterrent effect of an opportunity for prompt cure, followed by a responsibility to deal with those parties who promptly notified you that you are out of compliance. This, we believe, is a system which will not inhibit any of the ongoing compliance activities of the Foundation or others around the world who have begun also to act in defense of freedom and which will provide a much more effective environment for dealing with the large number of claims potentially arising from a non-compliant whole distribution situation. This would not be a presentation about the GPL by me if uh, emphasis were not placed upon what you see before you now. This license is not a contract. You are not required to accept this license in order to receive a copy of the program. You are not required to accept this license in order to receive a copy of the program. We have not argued now, nor will we, nor can anyone argue who reads the text of the language that the receipt of the code is some quid pro quo for the acceptance of some terms. If you are existing in a legal system in which that wasn't what made it a contract, then go with God. But arguments based upon the contractual exchange of the code for promises of compliance have nothing to do with us. We give permissions here, and the enforcement weight of our license lies in the fact that you have no permission to propagate, that is, you have no permission to do what copyright law requires permission to do, but through this license. That's our legal theory, and we are sticking to it. The reason that's our legal theory and we are sticking to it remains the one we gave before. There are 168 or 183 contract law schemes in the world, and the more you depend upon them, the more variability you will have. Burn is good. The harmonization of copyright is good for us. Our rules will use a tool set that is as close to global standard as we can gather. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are in favor of copyright law as a general matter. <laughs> We're not totally against copyright law in a simple or blanket sense either, but we're not defending the global copyright system that has been mostly imposed on the world uh, merely because we use it because it's there. And that has to be very clear. We are not endorsing the Burn plus WTO system of copyright law as it stands as a good thing. But it exists. And whatever harm it may do in other areas, we're trying to do some good with it when we can. Richard would also agree, I think, that the copyright law of 1897 was better than the copyright law of 2006. Um, 
Uh, the automatic licensing of downstream users provision that you see before you is modified solely uh, to take account of expanded compatibility provisions. What was a, com uh, a straightforward proposition under pure copy left that every downstream user receives uh, from every upstream modifier or other licensor an automatic license under GPL requires a little additional rephrasing when terms both permissive and requirement-based may be added to subparts of the code. Now, in Section 11, we reach, as Richard told you in his opening, the next major area of change under the license. These two paragraphs uh, point in different directions, and I want to take them separately. The first paragraph is simply a grant of patent claims that every distributor, licensor, modifier makes in the act of propagation that allows others to receive copies. When you distribute a covered work, you grant a patent license to the recipient and to anyone who receives, permitting for any and all versions of the covered work all activities allowed or contemplated. This patent license is non-exclusive, royalty-free, worldwide, and covers all patent claims you control or have the right to sublicense at the time you distribute the covered work or in the future that would be infringed or violated by the covered work or any reasonably contemplated use of it. GPL version 2 depended on the implicit patent license in U.S. patent law, which is assumed to burden any manufacturer who distributes a product patenting, uh, practicing its own claims. That implicit patent license in U.S. law had the flexibility of obscurity, and we appreciated that. Unfortunately, we can no longer afford any obscurity with respect to patents, and it was a creature of U.S. patent law, absent in most of the world's patent systems and actively disclaimed by some. It was therefore clear to us that a deliberate and explicit grant of patent rights would be necessary in the license, and this is it. Those who have... Uh, fun making patent licenses, a subgroup of a subgroup of a subgroup in this room, may be able to improve on that one, and we certainly encourage the attempt. The last sentence is a different kettle of fish altogether. Here, we face a problem that we all, or at least those of us steeped in the patent problem as it presently exists, know is there, but which everybody has been reluctant to deal with, and we now serve notice that something must be done. If you distribute a covered work knowingly relying on a patent license, you must act to shield downstream users against the possible patent infringement claims from which your license protects you. This is not about restrictions upon you put by that patent license. That remains covered by the used to be section 7, sec, new, now section 12 that I'm about to show you. This is not about what happens if your license contains terms incompatible with GPL. That's a separate question. This question is what to do to prevent distributors from insouciantly putting their customers or beneficiaries in a position of danger from which they themselves are exempt by non-sublicensable licenses. We recognize that for parties who have extensive portfolios that are extensively cross-licensed, what we are saying here for the first time creates questions concerning their cross licenses in relation to their distribution. We recognize also that to say that you must act to shield is not explicit enough. We recognize that this is a very hard problem, and though we have worked long at it, we have no unique solution to offer you, even as a beginning for conversation. 
In this coming year, those of us within this group who care about this problem, who are affected by the question, who have deep knowledge of this issue and who bear many patents as a badge of, well, whatever it is that bearing many patents is a badge of, will have to work at it together. But we believe that the community must now face that question, how to prevent people from being deliberately endangered by those who are not suffering with them a common fate. Note that the words are, if you knowingly rely on a patent license, we are not speaking about what happens if you have many tens of thousands of patents and cross-license for many hundreds of thousands more and have no idea whether a particular claim uh, that you may have cross-licensed might read on some code you might be distributing. And the question of what constitutes reliance on a license is also open for discussion. But the basic principle is one we believe we must now deal with, that parties should act with recognition of the danger that patents pose to their customers, their colleagues, their distributees, and that we should demand of people that they affirmatively act to do what they can as part of a community to constrain the harm that patents are doing to that community at large. The Patrick Henry provision. If conditions are imposed on you, whether by court order, agreement, or otherwise, that contradict the conditions of this license, they do not excuse you from the conditions of this license. We always thought that was pretty obvious and straightforward, but its implications aren't quite so simple. If you cannot distribute the program or other covered work so as to satisfy simultaneously your obligations under this license and any other pertinent obligations, then as a consequence, you may not distribute it at all. Again, we always thought that this was straightforward. We wish to point out, both in that language and in the illustration, that an agreement which imposes obligations on you, like a court order or other judgment, raises the problem, which we used to call a Section 7 problem, and we shall now find ourselves calling a Section 12 problem, uh, raises a Section 12 problem because those conditions are imposed on you whether you have self-imposed them or they have been externally imposed, it's the fact that you have conflicting obligations that prevents you from distributing. It's not a punishment, it's the observation of a fact. It's not good enough to say, I had to violate the license. You just can't. This has always been seen as about the patent problem, and in some sense it is. It wasn't the only way you could get into Section 12 trouble, but it is the way which was most commonly understood in the course of the last few years as the patent problem became ever more severe. However, there were also cases in recent years where people seemed to want to use Section 7 as a device of explosion, an improvised explosive device, if you please, inside the GPL. Some people seem to have come to the conclusion that merely by yelling patent or by offering a license incompatible with GPL, that they could somehow prevent GPL distribution of works. We knew that that was bogus, and we thought it was important to make it clear in this license. If you impose conditions on yourself or if conditions are imposed on you, then this clause has effect. If you are threatened or if bloviation occurs in your neighborhood, that has no effect. And we hope it will continue to have no effect in future. Um. <clears throat> the need for this provision was underlined by a recent article talking about a GStreamer plugin, which includes uh, source code distributed 
under an X11 license, or so it says, but then when you read further, you see that, in fact, that's not the whole of the license, that there's a patent license involved also, and that, in fact, it's not free software at all. And this was presented as a way of making things better for our community. So if you believe that a non-free program can make things better for people, that it's a step forward, as the author of the article I read did, then you might think what they did was great. But if your goal is to make sure, is to defend users' freedom, to establish a community of freedom, to spread the idea that freedom is important, then, we, then you cannot accept the idea that such a thing is a positive step. It's a surrender, not, a, not a, an amelioration. And so the liberty or death article of the GPL is just as important as it ever was. I have always thought of this as a truth in labeling provision. That code labeled GPL and therefore free had to be, in fact, what it said it was, and that anybody who couldn't produce the freedom under which they were labeling the software oughtn't to be able to apply the label. And if the only terms on which you could distribute were by applying the label of freedom, then you couldn't distribute at all. Uh, but whether it is or is not truth in labeling, it is, as Richard says, about protecting liberty, and therefore uh, I uh, withdraw my dissent from the title. Uh, the, the reason I wouldn't call it truth in labeling is that it applies to people who are redistributing software. If it were just a matter of what, you, if you could just choose any label and we only insisted, well, don't call it GPL covered, that would be truth in labeling. That supposedly X11 licensed program that isn't really, that's an example of uh, dishonest labeling. But since we say that modified versions of GPL covered programs can only be released under the GPL, we're not offering them the option to label it differently. So now, we shouldn't describe this as truth in labeling. Now you know how we have spent September, October, <laughs> November, and December of 2005, though it was noisier sometimes. <laughs> GPL version 2 contained in section 8 a provision concerning geographical limitation. In 1991, encryption regulation in the United States had not yet given way to reason, and there were many reasons to think, including the looming patent problem, that it might be necessary to permit licensors of GPL code to rule certain parts of the earth out while still distributing under GPL in other places. There was some very limited use of Section 8, but we believe that it is not necessary to include in the license, and we have included it in the current discussion draft of GPL3 as a section slated for removal. Unless in the coming year's conversation, parties can show reason why it ought to remain in the license, we propose to remove it from GPL3. We have not altered the revision clause of GPL, but I would like to remind you of it because it bears closely on what will happen at the other end of the conversation we are about to undertake. We have said in GPL 2, as we say in the current draft of GPL 3, that FSF may publish revised and or new versions of the GNU General Public License from time to time. Such new versions will be similar in spirit to the present, but may differ in detail to address new problems or concerns. A statement in GPL 2, which we believe the draft we submit for your consideration and discussion today fully bears out. Under the effective provision following, it will be possible automatically to reversion each GPL version 2 or any later version program for any party who modifies or redistributes the code after the effective date of GPL 3. 
Some projects have chosen to distribute code under GPL version 2 only. And those projects will make a direct and deliberate decision whether or not to relicense their code under GPL version 3. We have no power over those projects' decision making, though we hope that by making a better license, they will be convinced that it is wise to change versions. There are many projects that are GPL version 2 only, though there are comparatively few that are of significance in current commercial and non-commercial widespread use. But for those developers, some present here and some not present here today, we are, after all, in the position of offering a license for all the code, the vast bulk of GPL code, which was released under version 2 or any later version, what we do in the course of our conversation leading to the adoption of the new license will involve automatic reversioning, decentralized in every hand which redistributes or modifies and redistributes code. I remind you of this in order to remind you that most of the version transition at the other end of our process will be smooth, quick, and automatic. And some projects in which some developers here and many developers elsewhere around the world participate will make a deliberate relicensing decision of a kind more traditionally associated with how copyright licenses are changed. We will interact with every such developer who cares to come into the process to discuss his, her, or its needs or desires for the license, and we wish them the best in making their decision. But we are not attempting to coerce any decision by any such project. They reserve choice, waiting to see what the future held, and we will simply go about the business of making the best license that we can. I do want to say, though, that projects that do that, that distribute only under a specific version of the GPL, should take steps to make sure they're really in a position to consider moving to the next version. If they don't do that, they're likely to be stuck, and that would be rather unfortunate. The warranty exclusions uh, that were in GPL2 have not been changed, save in one way. I took them out of all uppercase. <laughs> I've wanted to do that for a very long time. I've wanted to do that for a very long time because no lawyer on earth knows why they aren't in mixed case. And everybody seems to think that everybody else knows, and he's the only one who was absent that day in law school. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Of course, it is also the case that most lawyers in the world don't live in the United States or even in the United States and the UK, and they've never heard about the mill wheel that broke and the shaft that wasn't delivered, and they didn't understand what we were talking about anyway, and we have tried to address that problem in a different way. But at least we're no longer shouting. Uh, is it really true that most lawyers don't live in the US? I thought we had far more lawyers per capita. <laughs> Richard has met so many lawyers in the United States that it hasn't uh, actually sunk in yet that even that's only a small part of all the lawyers there are. Um, we have added uh, one last statement to the collection of statements about warranty. Um, there were no ABS braking systems containing embedded free software in 1991. Nobody was running railroad trains or flying airplanes with guidance systems with embedded GPL software in them. And the question of use of freely modifiable software in safety critical applications was not then on our minds. It is now necessary, I fear, to disclaim one additional matter with respect to liability. And we assume that those who do provide 
free software under GPL in safety critical systems will exercise their right to add a warranty for a fee uh, as provided for by the license. But as received, GPL software is not warranted to perform correctly in conditions where correct performance uh, is necessary to save lives. Uh, that's a quick run-through of the text of this license. You may think to yourself, it should have been shorter. How could it have taken 28 slides? Um, the answer is, uh, protecting freedom is hard work. We know, we've been doing it a long time, and it's not as simple as it looks at the beginning. We share with you the wish that the license were shorter and we've got a year to figure out how to do it. But I will tell you this, that the requirement that you know what the consequences are of what you do, and that you can verify as best humanly possible that the unintended consequences won't wear away what you had in mind, have borne very heavily on us. We've spent hours marching up and down and waving chalk and arms and bellowing in order to try to keep bad things from happening with consequences that somebody hadn't foreseen. I look forward to a lot of conversations with a lot of people who have a shorter GPL-3 in their back pockets and want me to read how neatly they got it to fit on the back of a matchbook. I look forward to that much the same way that those patent office examiners look forward to the next perpetual motion machine that wanders in. I don't want to declare that it can't be true. There's no second law of thermodynamics that says that this is the shortest possible GPL-3, but I fear that doing it short and sweet, though many people will be itching to try as early as lunchtime, is tougher than it looks. We look forward to hearing that we can do what we have done in fewer words, or even that something we have done could be done more simply and just as safely. But safety first has been our goal, and we believe that the complexity incident to the license is the complexity necessary to achieve safety. So, uh, By the way, I don't think we were using any chalk. We were using computers to write things down. Yes, I was using the chalk after you went home at night. Sometimes I had to <laughs> chew it. You, do eat it. <laughs> you see how it is. Um, there was chalk involved. He just wasn't around for it. Um, yeah, it was curing my indigestion, actually. <laughs> Some rumors necessarily flew while we were at working. Secrecy was not our goal for its own sake. I'm glad that we got here without leaks. We needed quiet to hear ourselves think. But it wasn't to exclude anybody. It isn't that the hard work's been done and now it's over and there's nothing to do but clean up the cupcake crumbs. We've got a lot of work to do. The work we have to do is the work of collaborating. It's many eyes make bugs shallow. It's new ideas bring new opportunities, new applications, and new promises. This is free software we are making. We wanted to start the conversation in the right place, to pitch the conversation on ground we knew was safe and informative to avoid unnecessary disputes about matters that we didn't think in the end it would be realistic to put in the license, and to be flexible where flexibility would be desirable from the outset. We weren't trying to be argued into flexibility. We were trying to engineer flexibility in where it could safely be used from the beginning. We believe that by enhancing the license's compatibility with other licenses from the outset in this draft, we eliminate the need for contestation over the one right way, where there is no one right way. And we believe that by not promising more in certain areas than a license giving permission can deliver, as, for example, by not resting too much hope on patent retaliation to cure the patent mess, that we avoid breaking our fundamental promise to users that the license offers them a freedom which is real, not nominal, not merely a promise, but something on which the system in which we are all a part can really deliver for them. 
we hope that everyone will approach the forthcoming conversation in the same spirit. We don't need to foreclose options where compatibility will do. We don't need to insist on unique answers where freedom doesn't require a uniqueness of outcome. We are still in the business of giving permission, not in the business of constraining outcomes. No one on earth, not Richard, not me, not any you in this audience could have foreseen accurately in 1991 all the ways that free software would be in use in 2006, nor all the business models, research projects, firms, aggregations, distributions, live CDs, and all the rest that were coming about. The flexibility of the license made it possible to do what was done, and the strength of copy left kept it from all winding up in some one guy's pocket. We need to preserve both those characteristics for the next few years. It is just as important to remain flexible because everything that can be done with computers is being done with free software and more things can be done all the time. And it is just as important to make sure that freedom doesn't wind up in anybody's sack because the sacks are still there, the hunters are still hunting, the idea that every device on earth ought to run all the same thing and I ought to own it is still an idea in far too many brains and freedom still means what it meant before. The right to use, the right to copy, the right to modify, and the right to share. We think that we have put the conversation where it ought to start. We think we're getting off on the right foot. We think we've put the issues out where we can see them. But we are sure that there are issues we haven't seen. So the process that begins after this conference is a process of eliciting comments and making issues and finding the arguments and resolving the issues with opinions based on reasons. I'll talk this afternoon in more detail about the process itself and how all of us, in committees, out of committees, on websites, in our follow-up international conferences, can participate in those activities, making comments, finding issues, evolving arguments, and assessing reasons given for outcomes. But right now, what I want to say is I'm really glad it's all about to be your problem. <laughs> There's been a lot of trying to make it your problem while we weren't telling you what we were up to. There's been a lot of figuring out how to make a process and how to make a discussion draft that would maximize your power to contribute. I take that seriously, as I know Richard does, as the fulfillment of the commitment in GPL2 that the licenses to come would obey the same spirit. That word, spirit, appears once in the license and about the spirit of the license. And I think it's appropriate to close this presentation by reminding ourselves of what that spirit is. It's the spirit of tinkering. It's the spirit of hacking. It's the spirit of making the unexpected invention out of the materials lying around to hand. You mean you can make a resonating antenna for Wi-Fi from a potato crisp tin? Yes. You mean you can make freedom from a copyright permission that's not a contract? What's that? Yes. What we have is an achievement that we all made over a decade and a half. What we do now is to keep it safe, to make it bigger, to add more people with more expertise, and I don't know how Richard feels about it, but I will say right now at the outset, so we make it possible for the Altacockers to retire and somebody else to do this next time around. <laughs> with that, I want to close the formal part of the presentation. I know there will be more questions than I can take, but I'd like to take a few. I'd like to say a couple of words first. <clears throat>
When I give a short speech, I tend to forget some points. I'd like to apologize to people for the dif difficulties occasioned by holding this event in the United States. I'm sure that for some of you who are here, this caused a certain amount of nastiness, and uh, for others, a fair amount of inconvenience. Some people refused to even try to come. <clears throat> Someone said uh, that the nasty treatment he expected wouldn't end with going to the U.S. consulate. Some people tried to come here and couldn't. One was not allowed onto the plane. Something was inadequate about his passport, he was told by the airline. Uh, others got no response from the U.S. consulates, even though uh, fees were paid to expedite their visas. Uh, we looked at the possibility of holding the event elsewhere and of holding parallel events, uh, seeing if we could arrange communication between them. It didn't seem to be possible, and ultimately we decided to hold it here. And that means all we can do is apologize. Who wants the honor of throwing the first to me? We believe so. So the, um, the very last clause was actually when I wasn't expecting the uh, safety, the nuclear power plant clause. Um, are you allowing for extra requirements because of that clause? The, or is it just saying don't use this in a nuclear power plant? The, uh, the even GPL version 2, as you may recall, contained a provision that said you may provide additional warranties and charge a fee for doing so. The disclaimer of use in safety critical applications merely says unless you received an additional warranty uh, from somebody else, you shouldn't assume that you got one uh, from us, and if you use software in safety critical applications, the risk is yours. That's all I think that it legally does. Other lawyers who worry about these questions will no doubt weigh in in due course. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is that because I can picture someone trying to have like some real-time kernel or something and, if, uh, and trying it, to impose a patent license on top if, of... If Larry and Sergey are going into the nuclear power business <laughs> in addition to everything else... Uh, Not that should, I know of. You know. Uh, okay. No, but I was actually explicitly thinking about like Victor Udike and trying to sell RT Linux into a nuclear power plant and having some sort of version 3 uh, conflict. I think there's a miscommunication going on. The real... The answer to the real question that I think you're really asking is, we haven't put any restrictions on such use. We're not trying to tell people what purposes they can or can't use the program for. I just want to make sure idealistically that we're not allowing people to add patent claims. Well, this has nothing as Okay, far so as I want to make sure that we don't then claims. say, well, because it's for a safety system, we throw out these patents. No, and I know we're not going to do that, but I just want to no, make sure. No, we're simply saying this software hasn't been tested in safety critical applications. Use it at your risk in such applications or get a warranty and pay for it. Anybody else? Might as well use the microphone while I'm holding it here. Um, question in regard to the uh, provision for add on clauses. Um, in the past, as you noticed, um, FSF has themselves um, issued some software with add-on clauses. For example, um, some of the um, uh, C libraries mm -hmm. have add-on clauses saying that they can be combined with other works. Some of the compiler libraries, yes. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. Um, and I noticed that that type of provision was not in the list of add-on clauses that would be permissible under this draft of those would three. have those would meet sections the new section 7's compatibility standards because they are additional permissions and any class of additional permissions is compatible with section 7 the only effect of sections of the new section 7 on such exceptions would be to ask that they be put in writing as the free software foundations exceptions always have been it is only the class of requirements 
which is closed. Were that class of requirements not closed, GPO would no longer be a copyleft license. You could add any requirements you want. We have only said that there is a limited set of possible additional requirements. The set of possible additional permissions is an open set. Uh, I think that maybe what you're, to make this clearer, in the beginning of Section 7, it says that the, your additional terms could be either a separately written license or they can be this license plus stated additional permissions. Now, that's in fact what we've been doing on those very libraries that you're talking about. So here we've taken that existing practice and explicitly acknowledged it. I don't think this was necessary for it to be permitted, but we've explicitly acknowledged it here, and also explicitly staying, stating what was true anyway, which is that when someone has added additional permissions, since they're additional to the GPL, and the GPL says you can release a modified version under the GPL, no more and no less, that means anybody modifying the code that has the additional permissions can take off the additional permissions and leave just the GPL. So Section 7 says that explicitly so there will be less uncertainty about it. Other questions? Well, we should get out of the front row after a while. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the intent behind the patent protection language that appears in the new draft. So just because it's easier to talk about actual firms, let's say IBM and Microsoft are the two firms I want to talk about. Microsoft either receives or else authors some GPL license code that it distributes through to third parties knowing that it infringes a patent right that I, a patent that IBM holds. In that case, under the language I saw, I think Microsoft would be responsible for guaranteeing that I, as a recipient of the software, was protected. Is that the intent? Is that, is that what was The meant? language guarantee did not occur there. We said take steps to assure, and as I made clear, we consider that to be a placeholder for a conversation to come. But, but the intent generally is that. that the that intent I is to recognize that if you are knowingly downstreaming patent risk, that you don't possess because of licenses that you have, but that are not sublicensable or that you are not sublicensing, then you should take some other measure to control that risk for your downstream distributees. We do not want people passing along to others patent risk that they know they are exporting and that they know they have a license to protect themselves against. So you use the word about four or five times, but so knowledge is an effective bar there. If I just don't know. Yes, we are not asking people to search on every distribution, every cross license and every item in the known portfolios of all potential aggressors. That would be flatly unreasonable. Everybody knows it. That's the whole problem of the patent system, that it is full of buried wrecks and menaces to navigation which nobody can or does know about. What we say is that the knowing sharing of risk on unequal terms with your distribution is a practice it has come time to control. And then the last question just on intent is, in the event that there's some patent claim that's really unrelated to the distributed work, doesn't, doesn't bear on the distributed work, that's not involved in this discussion. It's that's, only patent rights. That's correct. To work. It's, if you are relying on a patent license in order to distribute what you are distributing, and if you know that that risk is going to be borne by persons other than yourselves who are unprotected, that's too much, and we would like you to bear more of your share of the load here. We will not abate the patent problem until everybody recognizes that everybody's in it together. I had a, <clears throat> had a question about the 60-day um, mm -hmm. notice for noncompliance. I wondered what the, what that would do if, if I had a, a piece of software as a developer and I didn't know that uh, someone had, had not complied with distribution. Do, do I have 60 days? And if you go beyond the 60 days, do I have no ability to? 
All right. So the question, Henry, is have they cured and are no longer violating, and you find out that 120 days ago they were for five days violating and then fixed it? In that situation, if somebody was violating the license, cured it, is no longer violating, and you didn't complain within 60 days, then, yeah, they are off the hook. If they didn't know they were violating and continue violating, then within 60 days of any act of violation, you notify them and you may terminate their rights. Well, the goal is not to give people a short statute of limitations. The goal is to give people an opportunity to cure and to close the set of possible claimants where the, where the set is possibly very large, but no non-compliant distribution is going on. Here's the, most, here's the most problematic situation. Someone is distributing an appliance or a, a software collection with a large number of free programs in it, hundreds. We at the Free Software Foundation find out that they are violating, and we go to them and we say, you're violating the GPL. And they say, we're so sorry, we didn't know, we'll fix it tomorrow, and they do. Now, how do we abate the fact that there are hundreds of possible claimants out there, each one of whom can say, the moment you violated the license, you lost the right to distribute. If you resume distributing, I'm entitled to an injunction, statutory damages, possibly attorney's fees. It's a very tricky situation for parties who have moved rapidly and deliberately to come into compliance. Under GPL version 2, the foundation solution to that problem was to use our good offices and our enhanced ability to communicate with the free software community to try on their behalf to round up all the possible potential claimants and get forgiveness from them or a release. That was burdensome, difficult, expensive, and sometimes ineffective. The result was that parties who had promptly moved to compliance still had legal risk that it was over-deterrent to ask them to carry. And under the 60-day provision, that won't happen anymore. We have the biggest interest in the world still in making this license enforceable because we're still guy, the guys doing 90% of the work. We haven't done anything here that we believe will hobble enforcement, but we think it will give people additional reason to come into compliance quickly. And we think it is therefore on the side of improving, not disimproving, the stake of GPL developers and licensors who want compliance with the license. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Thank you. It's a good question. Thanks. I'm glad to see the license compatibility provisions. As a developer, previous compatibility issues have been a significant obstacle. I was wondering if you could speak to which free software licenses, if any, remain incompatible with this draft of the GPL. In particular, I'm interested in the old BSD licenses advertising clause and in similar clauses in the OpenSSL license. Um, but anything more you could say about that would be helpful. Richard, do you want to say anything? Well, the BSD advertising clause is not allowed. Uh, we don't want to, uh, to make the GPL compatible with something that we're campaigning for people not to do. Uh, I don't know what the license of open SSL is. It's even worse. Oh, well, <laughs> then I guess the answer is no. Uh. Look, the, the, goal, the goal of the permission side of the compatibility provision is to take permissive free software licenses and make them compatible. As Richard and you have just pointed out, that doesn't mean it's impossible to write a permissive free software license that, that contains uh, terms repugnant to GPL. And where it contains repugnant terms, we haven't changed anything. All of the material that has unintentionally or insignificantly prevented compatibility between permissive free software licenses and GPL is now addressed. As to, the, as to licenses that bear additional requirements, there are still a fairly large number of licenses that have patent retaliation clauses that will still be incompatible with GPL.
The reason that is true is that there are a number of licenses which do not limit themselves to real defensive retaliation. They permit forms of retaliation which we believe can be turned to aggressive use, to use patents not against other people's patent aggression, but to use patents for other purposes, and uh, aggressively for other purposes, and well, that... aggression, not aggressive. Fine. And that, E. Richard is right, it, it, to use patents in aggression, and that we still mean not to be compatible with. So there will be a, a, a set, I'm not going to state whether it is small or large, uh, but there will be a set of licenses that will remain incompatible with GPL because the retaliation is overbroad. And we can't accept overbroad retaliation because aggression against programs is a thing we are trying to prevent, not encourage. Thanks. Jeremy. So, uh, firstly, you guys didn't stop for a round of applause after you finished the presentation, and I really want to make sure you get one. <laughs> it makes me feel a little as though I've won the Golden Penguin, but thank well, you very much. <laughs> uh, you, you, I think you needed that. My question is about the DRM provision, if maybe you could... Yeah, yes, up. of course, my pleasure. Um, so, so what I'm trying to understand is the, the classic DRM is that you have a proprietary chip that runs proprietary boot code that basically just happens to run a signed, a particular signed version of GPL code. So, so the, the standard argument from the proprietary vendor is, well, you can run anything that hashes to this MD5 signature. Ah. So... You know, what I'd like to understand is how the new version basically combats that in, in a legal sense. So the language that you see there highlighted says, complete corresponding source code includes any encryption or authorization codes necessary to install and or execute the source code of the work, perhaps modified by you in the recommended or principal context of use, such that its functioning in all circumstances is identical to that of the work, except as altered by your modifications. So let us take an operating system kernel, let's call it the herd, uh, and let's say that you, uh, in your XYZ computer corporation, uh, sell boxes which will run the herd from boot, uh, if and only if they're digitally signed by the Allison Computer Corporation. Um, if you are going to use the herd in that context, you're going to have to give us the signature codes as part of the complete and corresponding source code, or the herd, as modified by Stallman, won't boot and run on Allison Computer Company computers. And even if it ran a little bit, it won't run identically to the version you were distributing. We do mean, uh, we do mean that the protected boot of the kernel called Linux or the kernel called, the kernels called the herd or any other such kernels are gonna have to be accompanied by complete and corresponding source code that would allow you to install it on that hardware and run it with that nub. We don't think that that's a mode that anybody is presently actually planning to employ because kernels change pretty quickly, and I don't think anybody actually thinks they can do the protected boot with signature and do maintenance. But if there's somebody out there thinking of doing it, if this is the license that emerges next year, they won't be able to do it anymore. Tommy in his bedroom will be able to sign the kernel Allison Computer Corporation and boot and run, or Allison Computer is in violation. Okay? Thanks. Now, we work very hard to do this without saying you're not allowed to use the code for certain kinds of purposes. Instead, we say you just have to include this information when you distribute it to people, the information that gives them control over their own computers. Hi, could you put up the part about the warranty protection, or the uh, patent protection? Uh, if you'll give me a little bit more help knowing what we're talking about, will this the, be it? The one where you promise to protect yes. sub-licensees. The, the last sentence you see on the screen now. Yes, correct. What, what is the result of that with small-time developers? If a developer makes a small project and it gets into a distribution, 
distribution is now distributing that software, they get sued. They turn around and sue the developer that just happened to get in a distribution. Uh, your small developer uh, distributed knowingly relying on a patent license that he had taken? Not, not initially. In, in this case, not initially. He didn't know that. But then he did later come to know. He pulled it, but the distribute. It wasn't that he knew about a patent. That's not the issue. This doesn't concern if there's a patent or if you know about a patent. It's if you were relying on a patent license, a different subject altogether, not a subject ordinarily faced by individual developers or small business distributors. This question is a question which largely affects large businesses with large patent portfolios and lots of patents. Patent lawyers. I don't want to say about this or any other subject, I'm not speaking to you. But there are about eight gentlemen in this room at this moment who know I'm speaking to them. And <laughs> they and we are going to have to figure out what to do about this. They're knowledgeable parties. They grok what this is about. It's not something we dragged them into or they dragged us into. The patent system has done it to all of us. We've been saying for a long time it was going to cause this mess. Now's the time we've got to start cleaning up Dodge. That's what we mean. Uh, it isn't a problem that 99% of the developers in the world have to deal with. They have to deal with the other problem. They ain't got no patent licenses, and that might hurt them. That's the big problem. That's the major part of the problem. There's a little problem. Some people are allowed to export the costs of the patent system because they have licenses that keep them safe. And we're just saying we need you guys to get a little more skin in this game because we're not going to solve the patent problem until we're all really and truly in it together. Regarding a free software project, which is currently, um, suppose it's currently licensed under GPL v2 or later. Um, when the GPL v3 is released, um, suppose there are multiple copyright holders. Is it necessary to get permission from everybody uh, who holds a, copy, a part of the copyright in order to relicense it as GPL v3? Not only is it not necessary to get all a copyright holders permission, it isn't necessary to get any if the current version of the work is licensed under GPL or any later version. Um, then each distributor or modifier and distributor may make a decision for her or himself whether to use GPL 3 or GPL 2. If a work is licensed GPL v2 only, then who has the power to relicense is a matter to be determined within that project by asking who has the contractual power, who has the legal authority, and we don't know the answer to that question and nobody without the specifics of the particular project's internal legal structure can know. Okay. Um, Although most such projects have no internal legal structure, it's the discrete topology, and that means that each author controls his own code. I'm not even going to uh, say that that's the legal conclusion. There may be those who have apparent authority. I would say only that the reason the Software Freedom Law Center exists is to try to keep projects from getting into that mess in the first place. Okay. In the case of um, the version 2 or later licensing, so that, that means that when the GPL v3 comes out, you can actually delete the copy of the GPL v2 that, that, that accompanies the program and put in, in its place the version 3 terms. Yes, because Section 10 of GPL version 2 says you can do that. So you can do it. Uh, sorry, pardon me, Section 9. I'm already <laughs> thinking in new, in new section numbers. Um, because Section 9 of GPL version 2 says you can do it, you have permission to do Thank it. Thank you. Okay. One of the great reliefs of this version is that it does make this sort of inner version compliance a lot easier, and I really appreciate that. I just want us to deal with this day to day. But that's not really what I'm going to ask you about. Uh, I, I've got a bunch of developers uh, who Could work you on. Speak a bit more slowly. Sorry, I have a number. Yeah. Hearing you. <laughs> I have a number of developers who work on GCC, uh, and. In one of the patent uh, slides, I don't remember which one, you spoke about uh, interfacing with patent-covered uh. um, libraries that may be part of an operating system that they may end up interfacing with. Uh -huh. So what I'm worried about is it might be demoralizing a bit to know that their changes to GCC may not be able to be run 
on Windows or Sun operating systems, even though we don't rely on those systems ourselves? On, on the contrary, okay. one of the reasons that we altered what had been called the system library exception was that questions had been raised about precisely that sort of case. Mm -hmm. Was it inappropriate to link GCC with a C library under proprietary terms, or a C library under free but GPL incompatible terms. The language of GPL2 seemed to us to state that that was permissible, but there was legitimate reason for doubt, and we wanted to make it clear that we always thought that mode of employ was reasonable, and we always thought it should be permitted, and it is by this language now explicitly <coughs> permitted. We hope on the contrary that rather than creating morale difficulties for those development projects, we should be able to give them better legal assurance that what they are doing is fully permissible and not uh, and fully compliant. Okay. So, because it looked to me, and I, I'm not very good at reading these licenses, I have to admit sometimes, um, that it was saying that if a patent license was required to get the operating system uh, libraries, that you couldn't then link. Um, if the library implements a standard interface, Okay. which is not patent encumbered in a way that requires a special license to which you would not have access th th it routinely I, I, I as it. part of the system, then there's a problem. But we if, like, for instance, they implement some patented algorithm inside their operating system that implements that interface, we shouldn't care about that. Well, that well, depends. Well, I, I, that's I'm not... Sure. So this is what I'm trying to confirm, because when someone buys a license to Solaris, for instance... They're probably paying some patent license as part of that purchase. I, mean, I don't want to speak for Sun. I'm just keep picking Sun. Yeah, I'm sorry. Solaris is free, isn't it now? Uh, open Solaris. Yeah, but it's not under the. GPL. Yeah. yeah, it's Look. not under the GPL, but it's it's free. So, so but, what uh, the standard interface is TCPA? Oh, Christ. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm going to sit down. Look. The, <laughs> We're now, we're now in a place where conversation in the discussion process is going to occur, Bruce, but I'll tell you what the answer is, all right? It would not be an acceptable mode of employ of GPL2 to put enhancements to GPL user land programs in system libraries, patent those enhancements, and then say it's okay to link to those libraries with the patented enhancements in them under the system library exception. And that's why the reference to patent <coughs> encumbrances is in the exception license language that we drafted. If the point is that there are patent claims that may read on general interfaces and that those general interfaces may be in that sense patent encumbered, but there is a license to that patent available for GPL employment, then it's not an issue. The particular example you gave, patents are available for GPL implementation, and so that particular example wouldn't raise a problem. But it is very close kin to examples that would raise a problem. It's never easy to give an answer about the relationship between free software and patents, because patents are an acute danger to free software, right? And one of the harms that patents do is they make us spend a lot of time thinking very carefully about facts it's expensive to ascertain and risky to deal with. And that's part of the general deadweight loss that the patent system imposes on software developers. One of the costs of the patent system is I can't give you a clear, quick, six-word answer to questions that begin, what if there's a patent and what if there's a program? You have to look at the program, you have to look at the patent, you have to look at the license. You have, it's, that's the work, right? could be circumvented through this interface, uh, specifically the DRM. Freedom can be circumvented by the patents, so it wouldn't be surprising if these terms would, but if specific oh, oh, wait, instances... Wait, 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 He's raising an issue that seems like, well, we haven't thought about, so we'll need to think about it. Yes. Uh, not right now, but... Uh, no, no. But yes, submit that as a comment, because no, no. we need to think about that. No, 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 that's right. The, I mean, the modalities, the modalities of interaction between all of these provisions and pathological uses of patents are complicated and troublesome, and we're going to spend months on it, you, me, and everybody else. 
you're right. We wanted to work through all those cases, and maybe we worked them through and we got it, and maybe we didn't work them through and there are holes. We've got to find the holes, okay? Um, could you go back to the previous slide, slide three, I believe? Uh, the previous one of this set? Yes, of yes. course. Um, I wonder if this thing about the encryption or authorization codes, um, okay, say there's this arbitrary kernel, uh, no naming names, um, and they were to, as a collective, decide, yeah, we're going to go to the GPL v3, and the downstream of this kernel has this thing where they sign the kernel binaries, not for the purpose of, of restricting use, but for the purpose of, um, like, if you insert a um, a module that was not built along with it, that uh, you'll be able to to know from stack traces if your kernel is tainted or not. Um, so I wonder if that kind of thing would be restricted or made complicated or in conflict. In that mode of use, you would no. give the builder of the kernel the keys to make that same decision, wouldn't you? Because he might build the kernel and he might be the one who'd want to know whether it was modified after build. In general, there's nothing wrong with authorizing code or signing code or encrypting code. The question is who has control of the keys? If the user has control of the keys, then all keying systems, et cetera, et cetera, are perfectly compatible with freedom. It's when you're trying to take away from the user the power to control their own machine that you're getting into trouble, and we're trying to keep GPL from being part of systems which say you don't control your own computer. Um, say, um, as part of the kernel build of this downstream kernel, a a brand new GPG key is is generated, and all the binaries are signed, and then the um, the signing key is thrown away. Yeah. So um, uh, that's not. Um, then the user, when rebuilding the yeah. kernel, would be able to pick a new kernel, build with it, authenticate the whole kernel to it, and throw it away. As long as the user can do it under her control, there's not a problem. Well, we have to check that, the fact, that this scenario, and that's our intention. We, right. do have to, we should check that the actual wording does the right thing. Well, that one, that, scenario, one is right? actually, that one is actually covered by a code need not be included in cases where use of the work Im normally implies the user already has it, because that's a case where the user is generating it. Well, but is it the user always who's generating it, or is it does one person generate it and pass it on to another? Fair enough. Uh, we'll we, fair enough. That's you know, the This is a comment, and we'll check carefully that the words do the right thing in this case. Okay, thank you. You uh, spoke earlier of. Uh, we are now officially running into lunchtime, and my judgment is we should postpone further questions to the afternoon session. If we deprive people of lunch and of their own personal copies of GPL3, uh, they're not going to like us. Thanks very much.